Hey guys, welcome to the Summit Heights Fellowship broadcast. My name is Edward Crouch and I'm the lead pastor here at Summit Heights. And before we get to our broadcast, I just wanted to say thank you for joining us. If you have a few minutes today, check out our website, summitheightsfellowship.com and you'll learn all about our church. We have a great student ministry, an incredible children's ministry, preschool ministry, and we do small groups all over our community from Mineola to Quitman to Winsboro, Hawkins, even in Big Sandy. We would love to have you check us out one Sunday. If there's anything we could ever do for you, please take a few minutes, go to our website, fill out that prayer card on our website, and we would love to pray for you, reach out to you, or minister to you in any way we can. Again, thanks for joining us today. We hope you enjoy the broadcast. If there's any decisions or questions you have at the end of our broadcast, please reach out to us at our number on the screen or on our website. We would love to visit with you. Have a great day. Enjoy the broadcast. Jake came up to me a while ago and he said, um, I said, man, Crystal sure can sing. And he goes, kind of like me. <laughs> not at all, not at all, not even close. And uh, as far as that playing the guitar and the drums, Pops, I want to see you do that next time. Amen. That's good stuff. Y'all give them a hand. Isn't it good to have them? Amen. A few months back, our elders and I were on a retreat, and we, we were asking the question, uh, we do this once a year, sometimes twice a year, we asked the question is, are we growing mature believers in Christ? Which led to the next question is, what is maturity, right? And uh, what does that look like? And, and how do you define maturity? And if you remember last week, Jake mentioned it a while ago, last week we kind of talked about our statements and our, our strategy and our structure. And we said last week that we unapologetically believe that Jesus is the center of everything that we do, that he is both Christ and Lord. And he is the Christ, he is our savior, he is our Messiah, he is our deliverer, but there's also that other side, which he is the Lord, and he is our master, our king, and our ruler, and I got to make a confession to you. I, as a pastor, as a preacher, and someone who communicates, I would much rather teach on Jesus as the Christ, amen, fully loved, fully forgiven, savior, but then when you flip over to that king side, that, that, that Lord side, there's something about that side of the equation, about our master our king, our ruler, doing what he says, that we serve him, that we deny ourselves, we follow him. And then that one word that everybody loves, obedience, right? How many of you guys love that word, amen? Yeah, all four hands, that's awesome. And, and exactly, I mean, nobody likes that word obedience. It's so much more fun to preach on the Christ and not so much the Lord, but yet it's in his lordship that makes us so uncomfortable. It's in his lordship that he said, hey, come follow me. That's where we begin to grow up in our actions and, and we grow up in our obedience. And so when you start asking that question, what is maturity? If I lined 10 theologians up or if I lined 10 scholars up or, or just 10 of y'all and I just asked, hey, what's maturity? You would give me one answer and you would give me another answer and you would give me another answer and there'd be some things kind of woven in there but we would hear things like go to church and not just Sunday morning, you gotta go Sunday night, right? Remember those? And not just Sunday night, you gotta go Wednesday night and if you don't have a prayer meeting on Tuesday night, then you're not mature. <laughs> and we could get 10 different reasons for what is maturity. But here's what I wanna make sure you understand. We're fixing to start a series on maturity, and I'm not claiming I'm mature, amen? amen? My wife will tell you point blank, he's not. She's right there. I struggle. 
And I want you to know this, your elders are not even claiming that they're mature. I'm not even sure after studying for this series, I fully understand maturity entirely. I'm just gonna be honest with you. I struggled with this and trying to figure this out. But here's what I am saying. I think there's something broken in our dialogue and our characterization of spiritual maturity because you can't really get one answer. And for me personally, I hope I'm maturing, but have I arrived? Not a chance. There's something in me that knows that I still have some growing to do. And I know this in theory, yet I struggle as I flesh it out that discipleship, discipleship maturity is kind of an organic process. We're never going to arrive. It has something to do with what's called sanctification. And, and that's a big word. And, and, and there's really two parts of sanctification. There's that one part that he is our Christ. And we have nothing to do with that part of our sanctification. It had everything to do with what he did at the cross, that he died on the cross for us. We weren't fogging a mirror. We weren't even alive at the time. So this part of sanctification has nothing to do with us, that we are seated with Christ. We are forgiven. We're fully loved, that he, that he did all that for us. But then that flip side of sanctification, Sanctification has everything to do with us, and that's when we make him our Lord, Master, King, and Ruler, and it has to do with us following him. And so there's this organic type thing about it, but when you strip away all the complication of sanctification, it simply means to be set apart, to be different than you were, that there's something in us that we are growing every day, becoming more and more like Jesus Christ, and that process continues until we die. And so the issue of spiritual maturity, maturity kind of gets goofy today, you know? I mean, it's kind of crazy. You'll have some Christians in some churches criticizing other Christians in other churches about, hey, you're not mature because you don't do this, or you've got long hair, you can't be mature, get a haircut. You know, I wish I could have hair, you know? I, I guess I do, but anyway, you know, it's all these weird rules that we make up, and this group's criticizing this group, this guy's criticizing that girl, and it just gets goofy. And then you put new believers into the bunch, those folks that are just coming out of the world and they're, they've made Jesus their savior and Lord. And, and listen, it's okay for them to be immature just like it's okay for a child to be immature. I mean, think about it. Four-year-old comes in the house wearing his underwear on his house, got another pair over his pants and he's holding one of your spoons claiming to be a soldier. You go, oh, isn't that cute? But if his daddy does it, it's certifiable, amen? I ain't mature. You, you lock that guy up. You see, I've been a pastor now for 14 years here at Summit, and I've got to be honest with you. I've had some conversations with people who's come here for a little while and left that have both hurt me and concerned me. In fact, I've had people come up to me over the years, and they've tell me, Edward, we're leaving the church because we're not growing anymore. I don't even know what that means. Or, or even this statement they've said to me, we're leaving because we want deeper teaching. Okay. I, I don't even know what that means half the time. They claim they need a place where they can grow and mature more spiritually. And I get it. I get it. Some people leave the church for legitimate reasons and they've left here for legitimate reasons. But so much of what people do, it's concerning me that we see people hopping around from church to church to church to church and they never commit anywhere and they're never really committed to grow and work through something. In fact, many of the researchers have found out that when people who are skipping around and people are coming in and saying, man, I'm mature and I need deeper teaching. I'm gonna tell you really what researchers have found out about that and I've even noticed about it is many of those people are judgmental, especially towards church, especially towards each other. There's a general harshness and tone and they're unforgiving and they're judgmental towards those people out there, whoever those people are. And they're really not interested in reaching unbelievers because they can't even remember the last time they won somebody to Jesus, let alone if they ever have. <laughs> they're self-focused, always dissatisfied. And this whole idea of telling people you're mature, that's always baffled me. In fact, you wanna put a red flag in my, in my world is when people come and they wanna join the church and they make an appointment with Paula and, and they walk into my office and the first thing they say to me is, I just want you to know I'm spiritually mature. Red flags go off everywhere. They do. Those kind of people scare me because on this, you know, it, it, they'll come in and they'll look at me and go, listen, we're spiritually mature. So what are you going to do for me spiritually because I want to grow? That's a legitimate question on the surface. That the problem is many times, not always, is a disguise to get positional authority 
and cause division. What I want to say to them is, well, since you're so mature, I'm going to stand back while you part the Red Sea. Amen? Go. I really wouldn't say that. That's what I want to say. <laughs> you see, telling people you're mature is like telling people you're wise. It's kind of proof you're not. In fact, the most mature people tend to be the most humble. You won't even know it. And if you're strutting your maturity, it's pretty clear you, you got some growing to do. And maybe what poses as maturity isn't always maturity. And there's apparently a certain set of subset of Christianity that, that they've got maturity all figured out. And I'll tell you how it kind of works is, is in leadership conferences and pastors conferences. I, I quit going to those about five years ago because here's kind of how it happens. And, and you may have been there before. That it usually starts off with a question, but so you're a pastor at Summit, huh? How many people y'all run? That's an ego question. So I always tell them 3,000. Not really. I'd be lying, but that's what I want to do. And then the next question is, is they kind of get this spiritual deep voice. And they go, so y'all do Sunday school or small groups? Really? And then they'll even go one step further. So uh, you're in a town of 1,100 and y'all have 600 people. So you attract all these people. So like, really, what are you doing with them? I don't know. So I just quit going to those things, you know? I just don't like the strutting. It's almost a condescending thing that they want to critique everything and they want to see what happens. So, so it, as we begin to ask this question as elders, we said, what does spiritual maturity look like? And so here's where we're going over the next few weeks. And we're not going to jump in there today. I just kind of want to do an intro today. And, and next week, we're going to jump into John chapter 12. And we're going to work through John chapter 12 through 16. And we're going to go back to what Jesus said. That is, Jesus was getting ready in chapter 16. And he was getting ready to go to the cross. And he was telling his disciples, hey, Lynn, I've told you all of this. And, and when you see a statement like that in Scripture, you go, what? All of what? You have to go all the way back to chapter 12. And Jesus laid out eight different things of what it means to be mature. And so over the next few weeks, we're going to walk through that. But before we do, I kind of want to give you five indicators that we've kind of put up to say, hey, this is mature. In fact, some of you guys that are new to church and you've just come back to church, this is why you left the church. For, you're going to hear some statements in just a minute about what we think is maturity and yet you probably heard something like this or saw something like this and you just said, dude, I'm out, man. I just don't want any part of it. And so before we do that, I just kind of want to throw some things at you. For instance, this statement right here, when did it become a sign of spiritual maturity when you and I take so much pride in how much scripture we know? I know some of you just heard me say that and you're like, wait a minute, it's wrong to know the scripture? It is if you're looking down at people all the time who don't know it. It is if you're always looking down on people. Paul said this in 1 Corinthians 8, verse 1. Look at that last sentence. He says, but also, but although being a know-it-all makes us feel important, what's really needed to build the church up is love. Or in other words, knowledge puffs up while love builds up. There's, I've been around some guys that literally strut their Christianity around and their Bible knowledge around as an accomplishment. And that is so wrong. Listen, I love the scripture and I want you to know the scripture. In fact, I try to read the scripture every day. I'd be lying if I told you I did it every day. There's some days I just don't, amen? amen. But as far as I can tell, scripture is supposed to be a bridge to people, not a barricade. It's not supposed to be a barricade that we put up. It should be a bridge to the culture. In fact, to do otherwise puts us on the same ground as a group of men that Jesus was very strongly against the Pharisees. We talked about them a couple of weeks ago. These are guys that were the most spiritual guys of Jesus' day. In fact, Jesus was harder on them than he was on people that didn't know him. You see, Pharisees, here's what I've learned is the older I get, the older I get, the more I realize I've got a lot of Pharisee in me. I've grown up in church. I grew up Southern Baptist. I'm grateful for my heritage. I'm a, I'm a recovering Baptist today, okay? I'm now a Jesus follower, all right? And I love my Baptist heritage. Don't get me wrong. Don't write me an email. I really do. But listen, I'm a Jesus follower. And the older I get, the more I realize I got a lot of Pharisee in me. In fact, listen to this. You might have a, be a Pharisee if you've ever said this, or maybe you've heard someone say this. Man, I'm telling you what, if they knew the Bible like me, they wouldn't be doing that. You ever heard somebody say that? Maybe your mama? Man, I'm just telling you, if, if you knew the Bible like I did, you'd be getting along so much better. And there it is. And one simple statement, judgment and self-righteousness. <laughs> See, I want you to know the scriptures. But when we get smug and superior about reading the scripture, we miss the point. And can I just say this? 
Arrogance is not a Christian virtue. It's not. How about this one? I follow the rules. And if you do, I'm really glad you do, okay? But listen, let me remind you something. That's not what got you into Christianity in the first place. Can I remind you that what got you into Christianity is the grace and the love of Jesus Christ when you were breaking the rules. Isn't that good? See, we got in because of the mercy of Jesus. And all of a sudden, what happens is, I remember about four and a half years ago, I was having a conversation with a guy that left our church. And when, man, when they came into our church, they were jacked up. Can I just say that? And I remember we were sitting down and having lunch one day, and he looked at me and said, we're leaving the church. I was like, why? Why are you leaving now? And here's what he said. He goes, because all that love and forgiveness crap doesn't win people to Jesus. I was like, Really? Remember about four years ago, I'd just come off sabbatical and my identity was all jacked up before I went. I came back and I realized I'm fully loved, fully forgiven and, and all this religious stuff wasn't doing it for me anymore. And I finally figured out Jesus loved me and I was preaching through that. And he looked at me that day and I never forget, so he looked at me and said, let me tell you what you need to be doing, preacher. You need to be beating the blank out of people every Sunday. And you fill in the blank, okay? I'm not gonna get an email and say it. <laughs> and then he cut, followed up and said, and you need to be beating the blank out of me too. I remember I was sitting there and I looked at him and I said, so we didn't reach you that way. And now you want us to change who we are now that you're a rule follower and just start beating people up? Yeah. Okay. You see, I think we should follow the rules. But following rules should be a response to the love of God. Not in trying to earn God's love. Our attitude should always be gratitude and amazement and humility. How about, how about this one? I love this one. You shouldn't hang out with those kind of people. Who are those kind of people? You ever wonder that? I mean, we have people coming to us that just tells you, y'all shouldn't be hanging out. Shoot, if you look around this room, none of us should be hanging around with each other in this room. Amen? I mean, hello. I see y'all red rooster and love and war and all the places y'all go. Come on now. And I'm there with you, amen? <laughs> listen, as kids, I know we gotta be careful helping our kids choose their friends, but listen, when we apply that to adults, it's wrong. The reason churches aren't growing today is because Christians don't know any non-Christians. They don't know any. How, how about this one? I love this one. God listens to my prayers. What? Like he doesn't listen to mine? It's almost a condescending thing. Listen, I love prayer. And I, I trust that God listens to our prayers, but listen to me, listen to me big. It gets weird, man, when you're always going around, God listens to my prayers. And it's almost like a button you push instead of a relationship you establish. See, prayer's amazing, but it's not a button you push to go around bragging about what God's doing for you. It's more of a relationship we're pursuing. How about this one? Sure, I have issues, preacher, but that's between me and God. And listen, if you keep it between you and God, people are never going to be able to relate to you. How about this one? People need to stand up for Christian values. Can I just say this? I think social media has done more damage to the cause of Christianity than anything I've ever seen in my whole journey. I've seen more ticked off Christians trying to get non-Christians to live up to a moral standard of Christianity that they don't even know about. And I see more arguments on Facebook trying to get them to line up to a standard they don't even know. It's no wonder people are leaving the church in droves. I don't even want to come to some of the discussions I see on there. I agree with Andy Stanley. I think as Christendom slips away in our lifetime here in the West... When you remember growing up in the 50s, 60s, and 70s where Christianity had a majority and we always had a voice and it seems like now we don't. Listen, we're gonna have more in common with the first century believers than we have in common with the 20th century believers that just left. I'm telling you, the first century believers lived out their faith in a world that didn't share their values. The Romans could care less about the way. The Romans didn't care about Jesus. And yet, you know what they did for the non-believers in their day? They laid their life down for them. I mean, why in the world would we hold non-Christians to a standard when they don't believe? Jesus and Paul never did, not even once. 
People get mad and angry and demand we stand up for our Christian values. And yet I think the biblical argument runs the other way. You see, knowing a bunch of Bible stuff doesn't make you mature. Because it's not about what you know, it's about who you know and who knows you in Jesus. And then living that out authentically. Biblical application in love. So see, for many of us, we think just because we know a bunch of the Bible, some of the meanest people I've ever met know a whole bunch of the Bible. That's why some of you left church and said, I'm done. I don't want to be around those people. I don't blame you. Let me tell you what else is not maturity that we mistake. Truth without grace. Truth without grace. Being all about truth is a problem. And can I just tell you this? I'm a type A, choleric personality, prophet, spiritual gift. I love truth. But here's what Jesus said, or John phrases about the arrival of Jesus in John chapter 1, 16 and 18. He said that Jesus came filled with truth and grace. A good friend of mine said, Jesus is a velvet brick. Isn't it good? He's a velvet brick. He's both truth and grace. It's fun. It feels good, but he'll knock the snot out of you. Amen. Yeah, one of the things I love about Jesus is he never separated truth from grace and grace is never separated from truth. He was always grace filled when he spoke what is true because truth is always designed to lead towards grace. Yet some mature people feel like it's okay to land on the side of truth without grace. I've been there. This is where I find myself sometimes. And you'll have those people, let me tell you something, brother. I'm just a truth guy, man. I'm just telling the truth. And I just want to say, maybe you're a jerk. (laughs) Or as my wife says to me sometimes, you're a bully. Because I can be. And so when it comes time to say something hard, and I'm tempted to speak truth, I really have to back up and make sure it's both truth and grace. You see, it's not how much Bible you know or truth without grace, but even on the flip side, grace without truth. There's a whole group of people and churches out there that the opposite is true, that in the same way that truth isn't truth without grace, grace isn't grace separated from the truth. There are some of the mature people out there in the world that that, kind of land on this theological spectrum that they avoid the truth side of the equation as if love floats with no backbone. And yet love has a backbone. He was nailed to a cross. His name was Jesus, man. And you can't separate grace from truth any more than you can separate truth from grace. It's an incredible difficult line. It's a tension that I think in the church we all struggle with, both grace and truth. That's why we need a savior. Let me throw another one up here while I'm at it. We're just gonna rock on along here. How about this one? Sometimes we call maturity that we're harsh towards those out there and we cut insiders like ourselves, slack. Yeah. (laughs) You ever been around those people who consider themselves spiritually mature and they love to talk about how awful the world is? And it is. Pick a headline, amen? I mean, the world is awful. And yet so many Christians, this is why some of you left the church and never came back. So many Christians behave as if God hates the world. You know why they do that? And here's their answer. Because it's corrupt. There's a bunch of sinners out there. But the truth is, so are you. A lot. A lot. Hey, I'm a sinner, man. I told you guys, you don't know know all my crap because if you did, you wouldn't come back. And if I knew all yours, I wouldn't let you come back. Amen? It just is what it is, man. I told you, I don't have it all together. But instead, here's what happens. We rail against the world's sins as if they shouldn't be sinning while considering, by cutting ourselves this ton of slack. What would happen if we began to deal with the sin in the church like gossip and gluttony and division and faction with the same conviction on Facebook and on social media as we do about sexual sin and abortion? Hello. We love to rail against abortion, don't we? Well, how about looking inside first? I know, just got quiet. If you're not convinced, study Jesus. You'll find out over and over again, Jesus extended invitations to the sinners and outsiders and reserved his harshest words for people like us. Ouch. I know. You see, we just have it backwards. If God so loved the world, who decided we shouldn't? 
And while I'm at it, let me just add one more. We extend grace towards outsiders, but not forgive those who are supposed to be loving on the inside. You see, it was Jesus who said this in John chapter 13. Look at this. This is interesting. So much tension in these two verses. He said, a new command I give you, love one another. And the disciples were looking at him going, well, duh. Yeah, we've seen, we get that. Then Jesus says this, as I've loved you, so you must love one another. And then in verse 35, he says, by this. I said, by what? What are you talking about? By what? Everyone will know that you're my disciples if you love one another. <laughs> in other words, it's not how you treat them out there. It's how you treat each other. And here is how the world is going to know that you're my disciples. Listen, if you're holding grudges or bitterness or claiming you can't get over something that someone did to you, maybe you need to go back and read that again. I hear way too much in the church today, even in this church, people are grumbling, complaining. Well, they hurt me. And dead gum and I, I'm just offended by them. They didn't hold up their end of the deal. I'm done with them. Disappointed. They didn't let me down. I ain't moving on. They didn't hold up their end of the deal. I'm done. Boy, we'll extend grace to sinners and lost people. A dead gum, we're going to be at odds. And let me tell you what happens when that happens. You become prideful. You secretly come to believe that you're the smartest person in the room. Because that's what pride does. You begin to believe you're the smartest guy in the room. Oh, you wouldn't say it out loud. But you, there's something in you that thinks you're so mature, you deserve a corner office. You deserve to be on that committee. That's why we don't have them. Amen? <laughs> Got rid of them things. Amen. I'll tell you what happens when pride comes in. The smell of death is in the air. The smell of death is in the air. In fact, Paul said in 1 Corinthians 10, be careful that when you think you stand, lest you fall. See, a sure sign of when you begin to believe you have nothing to learn from certain people, you become prideful. That you basically have come to believe that you're better than they are and concluded that they have nothing to teach you. I'm done. I'm not going to be in their group. I'm not going to be around them. I'm not going to meet with them. I don't care how many times they call me, email me, text me. I'm not meeting with them. I'm busy. Because hmm. basically you just think you have nothing to learn. And you're just insecure because that's what pride, prideful people are. They're insecure because you stop learning from people that you become envious of. See, there's people above you who think you should be more like, you should be more like them, but your insecurity stopped you from learning from them. You can't learn from people you're jealous from or that you're mad at or you're bitter at. You see, proud people love to point out the flaws of others. Maybe not to their face, because seldom do they follow the biblical model that if someone has offended them or someone's hurt them, that they go to them. Here's what they do instead. They invite their friends over for dinner, and the small group turns into a, yeah, turns into this whole deal. And see, it's easy to address the shortcomings whenever you see them, but to address your own, hey, man, that's between me and God. It's amazing, isn't it? It's amazing. And just while I'm at it, while I'm going to offend everybody, let me go ahead and go out on a limb here, okay? Because see, when I find that when people start leaving the church and people come to us and they say these kind of things, and, and uh, they're, they're, I think one of the biggest marks of spiritual maturity is that, that, that a mature faith has a deep investment into the kingdom of God. And, and what I've noticed over the years is that when people come to me and say, well, I'm not growing here and I need to grow, go somewhere I can grow spiritually, is that if we check their giving records, and we don't, by the way, okay, so just relax. Because some of you are going to get stuck right there. Y'all check my giving records, how dare you? We don't. But if we check their giving records, we just might find out they're not as invested as it looked like. In fact, about 12 years ago when we went through our split and 100 people walked out on us, I had a man literally walk up to me and tell me point blank. We were a small congregation, and he point blank told me, he said, when I'm out of here, I'm taking my tithe with me, and you guys will never, ever, ever survive. You know, the strange thing is 100 people left, and we met budget that year, didn't we, Alan? See, there's something about investment in that. And yet there's some people that serve quietly and humbly. I, I'll have conversations with people even in this church, and I'm like, you did what? You knew who? Holy smokes, dude, why aren't you up here preaching? 
And if we hadn't asked, we'd have never known because they're just faithfully serving. So now that I've made you really uncomfortable, and if you're visiting here, you're thinking, I ain't ever coming back to this place. This dude's crazy. I get it, okay? So let, let's come up for air. And let me give you three things as we start this series because I, I, I want to mention three things as you're kind of squirming a little bit this morning. Maybe you're like me and you've gone, yeah, that's why I left church. And can I just say this to you? If you left church years ago and it's your first time back in a long time, you're safe here, okay? Uh, we're a bunch of jacked up people that love Jesus and we're, we're moving towards maturity, okay? We're not near as jacked up as we used to be, okay? Can I just say that? Not near, like you should have been here about five years ago. You saw a whole different bus. Some of you still clutching your purse, purse amen? Don't say it down, it might get stolen, all right? There's people like that probably sitting right back there. I'm not pointing any fingers. Anyway, so we're along on the journey, but come, this is a safe place. Let me say three things about maturity, and then next week, we're going to jump into this, okay, about what maturity is from Jesus. Number one, in Philippians chapter 3, verse 13, here's what Paul said, realize you have not arrived. Brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet. Now, remember, Paul was this Pharisee. He was like the Pharisee of Pharisees, and if anybody had had it all figured out, this dude did, and yet here he is writing, going, listen, guys, I haven't arrived. You've not arrived. And, and I want to say this for some of you. You've not gotten it figured all out. Let yourself off the hook, okay? Really. Some of you are beating yourself up every day. You've not arrived. Remember, this is an organic process. This isn't a check the box like when you're growing up Southern Baptist, amen? It's organic. You've not arrived. You don't have it all figured out. I have found that people change for one or two reasons, negative pain and positive gain. Positive gain is easy, isn't it? Listen, if, if somebody told me, hey, Edward, can you come by the house? And I was doing something busy. I said, man, I can't do it today. Ed, I'm gonna give you a thousand bucks. Would you come? I'm on my way. Amen? Man, I can change for positive gain. You might even go with me for a thousand bucks. Amen? Yeah, but it's in our pain where it gets tough. Where we go. See, we love the Christ. It's this whole thing of the Lord, Master. See, Chuck Swindoll says, pain plant, plants the flag of reality in the heart of a rebel. C.S. Lewis said that God whispers to us in our pleasures, but shouts to us in our pain. Listen, we all have work to do to grow up, to become followers that God has destined us to become. His plan for us is to grow up. Healthy things grow. Would you say that with me? Healthy things grow. Say it again. Healthy things grow. And aren't you glad your kids grew up and moved out? Amen? I want my kids to grow up. I love my babies. Don't send me an email going, you're a mean man. I'm not. I want my kids to grow up and be healthy because healthy things grow. I want to go to their house and drop trash in their floor. I want to go to their house and prop my feet up on their couch with my muddy boots. Amen? Yes. Healthy things grow. You've not arrived. Here's the second thing. Forget what lies behind. Look what Paul says. But one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead. Two things you need to forget, your failures, your sin, and your successes. Now listen to me. You need to learn from your sin. You need to keep your sin out there long enough to learn what you need to learn from it, all right? Some of you need to learn, you know what? I don't need to be having another affair. I need to quit looking at porn. I need to quit drinking too much. Nothing wrong with a drink. But listen, if you're getting drunk every night, there's something wrong with that, Okay? You need to learn from your sin. But then forget it. Put it behind you, man. Grow up. Let yourself go. Begin to grow. But also forget your successes. You see, if we are constantly looking back at, man, I remember the good old days. Man, I've been a part of churches like that, and it's like, it wears me out. Remember the good old days? And there's three of us sitting in the room. <laughs> Listen, we've had some great times at Summit. And I don't ever want to forget those, but I don't want those to become the main thing. I still believe God is calling us to more, to grow up in maturity and to keep growing in maturity. So don't remember your failures. And listen, to recall your failures over and over again is to downplay the power of the cross. We're fully loved, fully forgiven, man. Learn from your sin and let's move on. Listen, success is seldom final and failure is seldom fatal. Amen. We said a few months ago, simply this, that failure is never final where love exists, and that love is Jesus. So learn from it, but then put it behind you, man, and press on towards the call, because that's the third thing I want to come up and breathe this morning, is number one, realize you've not arrived. Forget what lies behind. Number three, press on for the future. 
Look what he says in verse 14. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Listen, no matter how bad you've messed it up, you may be sitting here this morning, you hadn't been to church in years, or you may have been coming back for the last few weeks or months, and you may think, just like what Crystal was saying a while ago during that song, man, I've screwed it up too much. Listen, 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 listen. God still has plans for you. If you're fogging a mirror, God still has plans for you. Press on towards that goal. Realize you're forgiven. That doesn't give you a license to go do what you want to do, but it does allow us to respond out of that love and that forgiveness to become more like Christ, to grow up. Jesus wants us to know that we're fully loved and fully forgiven, that he's the Christ, but at the same time, he's our Lord, he's our master, he's our king, and he has plans for us. And so over the next few weeks, we're just going to dive into what he said. We're not going to ask the Baptists or the Presbyterians or the Methodists or the non-denomination, Pentecostal or interdenominational, whatever that is. We're just going to say, Jesus, what's it look like to grow up? Amen. And we're going to look through those. And I, listen, I, I want you to come back. I, I would love to sit here and just implore you that every one of you wouldn't miss the next eight weeks. I know some of you are, okay? But listen, this isn't a checklist, by the way. Some of you, are, you're not going to miss the next eight weeks, and you're going to write down every one of those, and then you're going to check them off, done it, got it. Like the old Baptist envelopes, you remember those? Read my scripture, went to Sunday school, went to visitation. Uh, yeah, I read the Bible most days. You know, and where we check the boxes. Listen, I love Baptists. Don't, please don't write me an email, okay? I love Baptists, all right? I love Presbyterians, too. Um, I love them all. I, I'm a Jesus follower. I'm fixing to really get myself in trouble here, Paul. Um, <laughs> It's not a checklist. These eight things, I, I just, I'll tell you, these eight things I've been studying since August have messed me up. I'm finding I have more of a Pharisee and religious mindset. And I'm telling you, God's just constantly pushing on me. I want us to be mature, and I don't want you to miss these. But I don't want you to build a checklist. I want you to gain some knowledge and apply it in love, not in arrogance. You see, I, I think our lives should be different. I think as Christians, our marriages should be different. Our parenting should be different. Our, our love for our neighbors and each other and our community should be different. There shouldn't be a segment of people out there that we shouldn't, that we're sitting there saying, well, I can't hang out with them. That's the kind of people we should be. I don't care if the religious people walk by me and see me somewhere. Can I just be that blunt? I think our confession and our repentance and our forgiveness should be deep and authentic towards God and towards others. Listen, some of you in this room, you need to confess to each other. That's what's keeping you stuck is because you're prideful and think you're the smartest person in the room, man, and you're constantly stifling your own growth because you won't get honest that you have a grudge and you're bitter. Jesus said, they shall know you by your love for one another. And I'm not talking about all that lovey-dovey. And listen, he's a velvet brick, man. It's grace and truth. We should be known for that. And I just wonder... What would change if we began to pursue the application of these things we're going to learn over the next few weeks and the investment in the kingdom, what our lives are going to look like? So I want you to come back. And listen, if you miss it, we're live on Facebook at 9. You can watch it during the week. But there's something about gathering together and working through this. So I want you to grow with us. I'm growing right now. This is some of the hardest stuff I've preached so come grow with us, and let's learn together what it would look like for us to grow into maturity. Not religion. I hate religion. I'm sick of it. I'm tired of reading about it. I don't want to look at it. I just want Jesus, man. I just want more of what he has to offer, and that's where I want to grow up in, both Christ and Lord. Hey, thanks for being here. Let me pray for you. Lord, I love you. Thank you for today. Lord, I know that there's some folks here that heard some statements and said, that's why I left. God, I pray you give them courage to come back. This is a safe place where they can be who they are, to learn about the things of Christ. God, help us who are inside not be judgmental, not to jump to conclusions, but to love people and love each other. God, if there's some folks in this room that need to make an amends to each other, give them courage. And God, if there's just someone here struggling, as Crystal was talking about a while ago, 
God, would you just remind them they've not arrived? You still have plans for them. The enemy is a liar. So God, just silence the enemy right now and give them courage. Fill them with your spirit. Encourage them, Father. And Lord, as we journey together over the next eight weeks in this series, God, I pray you'd change us, that we would be set apart to look more like you. And God, the world would be thirsty for what we're becoming in you. So God, I love you. Thank you for today. Thank you for these tables that are set up around the room, those small groups and opportunities to serve, that we get to do that so we can tell more people about you. So we go to lunch today, Father. If we're going out, give us kindness to respond to our servers and uh, to be generous. So, Lord, I love you. Thank you for Jesus. And we ask all these things in his beautiful name. And everybody said, amen. amen. Have a great week. Hey guys, welcome back. We hope you enjoyed the broadcast today. And if there's any decision you felt like God is leading you to make today, we would encourage you to uh, make that decision and to go online. There's a prayer tab on our website that you can go to. We'd love to pray for you. We would also love for you, if you accepted Christ today, to send us a text. We have a number at the bottom of the screen that you can text us the word accept if you accepted Christ, or if you would like to know more about baptism, just shoot us a text with the word baptize to that number on the screen and we'll get to you, I promise you. Hey, have a great day and listen, if you're looking for a great church and you don't have a church home, come visit us one Sunday. We have two services, one nine, one at 11. We'd love to see you, have a great week.